see. Oh. <clears throat> okay. Well, I'll ask in advance and then I'll ask again once Anne Marie gets on, but do you all mind if I address you by your first names? Yep, that's fine. Please do. It's Shanda. Shanda. Very yeah. pretty. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Yes, no problem. Mine's Laura. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And you can just say Deb instead of Deborah. <laughs> okay. Whatever you prefer. I, you know, and I'm Rabia. I'm Dally. Some Dally. Say it different ways. Yeah. I'm, happy to have you say it your own way. Uh, <laughs> not that at my age, I'm. if I mess up, forgive me in advance. <laughs> you will be forgiven. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Got enough weight as it is. Oh my goodness. Okay. <sighs> mm -mm -mm. Okay. So I don't know. I got, I have to say, I got offered as tribute, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so not the speaker. This is going to uh, be interesting. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. Yeah, well, I agree for me too. Um, it's not my first poetry. I've never moderated before, so we'll be as fluid as possible. My thing is to allow you all to say what's most important because looking at these little time constraints, I was like, oh my goodness. You have so many things to offer. And that's why I sent the email. I don't know if you saw it saying, you know, identify the most important. Get started in it. Ah. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. So um, I always start everything and end everything with a prayer asking spirit just to be with us and to guide our thoughts, to guide our words and our hearing so that we give the best of ourselves, but we give also what spirit needs us to say. So since we're speaking in a way for the earth and for all people, um, help us to focus and, and give our very best. And we give thanks for that. So let's get started. So Deb, do you want to introduce yourself first or Chandra? I see we have you full screen. <laughs> uh, I guess I'll start. I think our, all our screens look a little bit different. So thank you for that uh, opening and everybody for joining the session. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what the panel has to say. Everybody looks amazing. Um, so I'm Anishinaabe from Whitefish River First Nation around the Great Lakes. Um, I also, I work at York University. I'm a professor there and I work in, um, Right now, basically, I'm sitting in a chair in Toronto, uh, uh, Toronto, Ontario, in, in Canada. And uh, some of the work that I do um, more recently, uh, definitely Indigenous environmental uh, justice, and now sort of orienting towards uh, climate justice and self-determined climate futures, because I, I try to base a lot of my work on what uh, communities that I work with and organizations work with say they want to go. So now, a bit of it is trying to figure out, okay, what are what are indigenous solutions to the challenges that we're facing, as opposed to putting all our energy into reacting to other people's solutions. So that's sort of briefly um, what I'm working at and looking forward to hear what, what others have to say. So Chimi Gwech for, for this uh, opportunity. Miigwech. Dali? Sure, yeah. Hi, my name is Dali Carmichael. I'm a research assistant with the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project and actually formerly one of uh, Deb's students. Um, I did my master's in environmental planning at York University. I'm also in Toronto today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody speak today. I think uh, it looks like a really incredible lineup for this panel. Um, and uh, on top of my work with the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project, I'm also a program coordinator with the Shared Path Consultation Initiative. So both of my jobs have to do with looking at uh, engaging indigenous, indigenous voices, empowering Indigenous voices. Um, 
Uh, I've been with the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project for about two years now. I started out doing strictly podcast producing for the project, and now I kind of have my hands in a whole bunch of different aspects of the project, and it's uh, it's uh, really excellent to to be a part of it. Um, I'm not an Indigenous person. I, I want to make that clear. I'm I'm a settler person, um, but uh, I've worked for it with Indigenous communities in some cap capacity for another or another for about ten years now. So. Uh, yeah, I'm just delighted to be here today and to hear what everybody has to say. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Chandra. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Shanda Robinson Banks. I am Piscawe Kanoi. Uh, the Piscawe Kanoi are a Maryland recognized tribe on whose uh, ceded land, um, unceded land, I should say, uh, University of Maryland College Park currently sits. Um, I am currently working with Ujama uh, Cooperative Farming Alliance. It's a BIPOC cooperative that is fiscally sponsored by um, Steam Onward. And Steam Onward is a Southern Maryland-based organization that promotes experiential um, STEM education, internships, entrepreneurship for um, youth who are, um, come from underserved communities. Uh, it was through this work that we started to see that the um, local food pathways were suffering during, you know, with the, with the advent of COVID. <laughs> uh, we recognized that the local food pathways were, um, were suffering. And so in realization of that, uh, Steam One Word uh, began to sponsor this cooperative, Sujama. Um, and I kind of tend to describe it as if the local food pathways are our client and we're providing wraparound services. Um, so with that said, uh, we have started moving slowly towards, uh, become, well, we became a, let's back up. We started doing kind of victory gardens for our seniors. And then from there we became a, uh, a local seed hub for free seeds. And then our next step has been to um, actually uh, attempt to steward culturally meaningful seeds. And so we're creating relationships with uh, seed companies to incentivize stewarding and growing culturally meaningful seeds, seed crops. Awesome. Okay, Aura. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, um, my name is Dr. Ora Merrick Martinez, and I am a citizen of the Diné or Navajo Nation. My mother and I are Mountain Cove clan, and my father was Nespers from Northern Idaho. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm originally from Lapway, Idaho in Northern Idaho. Um, and so I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, Arizona now with my family. And so I just wanted to, um, take a little bit of time and acknowledge the traditional landowners of the area that I'm on right now, um, Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, there are about 13 tribal nations that hold this area and the mountain that you see behind me to be a very sacred place. And so I just want to honor our ancestors, their past, their present, and the future generations. Um, and so I just want to begin with that. Um, so I think I'm a little bit off, um, not off, but I think I'm a little bit outside of the field. Um, I'm actually an archaeologist by training, and so I worked for the Navajo Nation for about 16 years. And so I was involved in archaeological and environmental work for the Division of Natural Resources. And so part of my work was um, really involved efforts to address climate change and the protection of cultural heritage throughout Navajo homelands. And so that was within the exterior, exterior boundaries of the Navajo Nation, but also in our ancestral homelands. And so um, currently I'm the uh, director of Northern Arizona University's Native American Cultural Center. I'm also an assistant professor in the anthropology department. And so really I support and teach the next generation of indigenous leaders. Um, also within my archeology span role, I'm a co-founder of the Indigenous Archeology span Collective. And so really I work to create change in the field um, and to really create spaces for indigenous peoples in research. And so one of my goals is, is really educating people about their, there's the connection between these sort of disparate fields of environmental and cultural resources, when really we as indigenous peoples look at holistic, uh, look at our environment as a holistic sort of approach. And 
um, that's what I bring to the research that I do as an archaeologist. And so really excited for the conversation and just really appreciate being asked to be a part of the conversation. So thank you. Thank you. It's awesome to hear you say Dene. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that I would like to make sure that gets in the conversation, and then I'm just um, would like you each to speak to what's, um, you know, what's in your heart, what you want to share the most that needs to be said. Um, I can ask you a bunch of questions, but I feel like you know more than I do what it is that's so pertinent for you to get in there. One of the things in, in many indigenous prophecies, it is that this is the time of justice. This is the time that women shall lead. And we see this all over the world, that women are stepping up like you, that are leading things that are, and we wanna make sure that as these things are being done, and women are expressing and empowering each other. And this is why it's so exciting to see you all because then it also stimulates other women that are sitting back uh, to come forward and do the work that they may already be doing, but not seen. Um, I wanna uplift LaDonna Brave Bull um, and what she did at Standing Rock and what she ignited shows that one person that sees something that needs to be corrected can speak out and have that um, just fire the imagination of everyone to come forward, but also for young girls to see there is a place and a voice for them. So I'm going to step back and, and let you all go for it and um, address what you need to, to address. So since we've already got you there, right there, <laughs> Aura, do you want to, um, and I don't think that you're out of place here. I think exactly because it has to do with ancestors and anthropology and the fact that our bones and blood are in this land have everything to do with the environment and, and there is a place for spirit in this work, which is never spoken about. Right, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that, that segue because that's really one of the sort of areas that I, I like to sort of address and, and really looking at, so one of the things I think that I'd really like to speak about are some of the issues that I face in, in the work that I do as an archeologist and really coming from a cultural embedded background. And so one of the main things that I've seen is confronting misconceptions about indigenous peoples and indigenous ancestral knowledge. And so within archeology, span there's really been a historical rejection of indigenous knowledge in site interpretations and really creating the archeological narrative. And so that becomes very factualized and, and then it becomes, it displaces indigenous knowledge and in, it, excuse me, it, it displaces indigenous peoples as experts of their own cultures and their own histories. And so we see this shift where indigenous knowledge has been sort of relegated to this maybe subpar knowledge where it's, it's, it's myth or superstitions. And, and those are some of the misconceptions that I've been confronted with. Um, and, and in particular, being an indigenous archeologist and trying to center indigenous knowledge about the past in site interpretations and providing opportunities for, for indigenous communities to reclaim their past using that ancestral knowledge that they have. And so, you know, we're really seeing a resurgence of the application of indigenous knowledge in all fields. And so I think in, in some of the more um, well-known cases, we see this within traditional ecological knowledge or TEK and fire management systems of indigenous people. And, you know, I really want to spotlight the indigenous Aboriginal people from Sydney and, and, and some of those communities and the work that they did to try to alleviate some of the burning there. And, you know, with their assistance, they really were able to control and, and help with those fires. And so bringing that knowledge back to the forefront and, and providing that space for it is something that is extremely important in environmental, social justice work. We've been given the tools and, and the knowledge from our ancestors. And we've had this knowledge for thousands of years. And so I think it's time for other people, other scientists and, and scholars to really 
reevaluate how they value knowledge and, and really begin to see the potential that lies within indigenous ancestral knowledge. And so those, I think, are, are some of the things that I would really like to see as, as changing. And, and it's really great to hear from the other panelists and see how their work, their own specific work is pushing and, and creating that space for indigenous knowledges. And so, um, you know, really looking at, um, from, for me as an indigenous woman, my identity as a cultural woman absolutely influences the work that I do in environmental and social justice and within archeology. span And so, you know, coming from a very tight knit community in Lapway, Idaho, there was really this sort of ethos and understanding of serving the community and making it better and stronger for the next generation. And so that really guides me in, in the research and, and the, the service work that I engage in as, as an indigenous woman. And so I have an understanding that if my work doesn't benefit or, or help communities that I'm a part of, then I really have to think about what I'm engaging in. And I'm very intentional with that work just as I've been taught. And so, you know, my, my culture has nurtured and supported me throughout my life. And I've really come to rely on my cultural knowledge and education in all facets of my life. And so it's a, it's a way for me to honor my ancestors and my communities. And so that's really how, you know, all of these things sort of tie together for me. So, and on that note, thank you. Okay, uh, Deb, you wanna jump in? Sure, thank you for that, Aura. Um, I, I'll start off with like why I think um, my identity is really important in, in the work that I do. And, and I think it's like Aura said, is really respecting sort of that lived experience and lived reality that isn't necessarily acknowledged or recognized or respected in the academy, but it but what it does is it just offers so much creativity and innovation in how we can approach uh, the challenges that we're facing and, and solutions. So, um, so for example, in the current work that I'm doing around um, uh, climate, indigenous climate justice, I, I guess is sort of like the broad way of framing it, um, how we're approaching, approaching the question, sort of like what Aura talked about is, is um, in the circles I'm in and climate change policy circles in the Canadian context, uh, we're told, well, you know, we weren't documenting, we don't have baseline for, for what indigenous communities were like. And so we can't really assess what the change is. But meanwhile, people have lived through this for 500 years plus. So what we're, we're using, uh, or the framework, we sort of using an Anishinaabek framework for this, which is the um, 13 moon system. Um, because that it's already in the stories that say what's supposed to happen at certain times of year. So the full moon is now for August. So what's supposed to be happening? Our stories tell us and they tell you about what's happening with plants, what's happening with animals, what's happening with fish, what we should be doing. And then we can see, is that still happening right now? Right now in Canada, there's a lot of forest fires. <laughs> and so the, the moon is weird because it's like orange and like there's all these things that you're mm -hmm. noticing that's completely different. But that's a but, um, so that's a framework that we're using and also the four elements. So what would what are you paying attention to? So we so we frame it within how we always um, thought about and engaged with with the natural world um, and ancestors and and non and the non human world as well. So so I think that's what it can bring those those kind of insights because you when I go into meetings and I'm looking at solutions that are being proposed and how assessments take place, um, a lot of that's ignored because they rely so much on the peer reviewed literature and there's just not enough of us to produce it. People weren't asking the right questions four decades, three decades, two decades ago to have that body of knowledge um, in, in the, like I'm involved in, in sort of the indigenous climate change assessments and usually, usually often the last minute, could you find stuff on this to answer this question? Um, so I think to me that plays um, a huge role is, is um, is really being able to draw kind of on your own strength. So it's sort of taking a strength-based approach because the field can be so daunting and challenging and depressing um, that you, you, need to, you need to have something to ground yourself. And I, and I think that's one of the um, advantages um, or, or strengths that we can draw on is our own uh, lived experience and, and our family's knowledge, our grandparents' knowledge and how that can inform these broader discussions. 
And as uh, Aura pointed, pointed out and others in, in their remarks is, others can learn from that too. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in Indigenous knowledge. Um, people may not know how to be appropriate with, with uh, engaging with people and that knowledge. And so we, st we really need to kind of continue to show that kind of leadership to, to show how this needs to be ethical and appropriate and benefit, <laughs> make sure it benefits Indigenous people and, um, and, and future generations. Um, I, I also, like where, where that's also taken me as well is um, to also look at Indigenous legal traditions. Like why are they important? Because the, 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 the legal framework right now that's supposed to be protecting the environment is failing. So we need to look at other places and clearly on Indigenous lands for thousands of years, people were engaging with their own legal traditions and knowledge traditions. Um, and, and again, because going to communities and asking what's important, languages come up and you rarely, you, it is very rare to see that in mainstream climate discussions, but in indigenous, indigenous context specifically, it always comes up. So that's what sort of that lived experience can just, can just get you thinking and, and move you in, in particular directions for um, solutions and, and assisting communities um, because they offer this perspective that isn't, that isn't in these other spaces. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Hopefully that's somewhat insightful and, and look forward to hearing from uh, Anne-Marie, Daly and, and others on this question. And, and uh, thank you, Gwetch. Okay, so I understand from our timekeeper, we're running out of time for this question. However, I want everybody to be able to say what they need to say um, around this. So um, let's continue on and um, Chandra, do you wanna go next or Dolly who? Um, I can go next, I suppose. Um, to me, it's my, con my construct that I operate within is slightly different <laughs> because of the fact that I'm in Maryland. So we are considered a triracial isolate, um, which is basically, we are one of the 13 original states. So therefore we were Catholicized in the 1640s, which is 250 years before the Dawes rolls. Um, so what we basically have been looking at more is um, food as culture. And so therefore we are looking to kind of, we're looking to rematriate seeds. We're looking to try to reconnect people to the land. We're trying to move people back to um, having a, a better relationship. So while we do have um, culture in a general kind of, con you know, in a, as a general concept, it's not the same. We're, we haven't been raised in a tradition that, um, yes, we've been raised in a tradition that honors the land, but it's not the, the fullness. It, it's not a robust history. Uh, and so I think that when I look at what I'm doing, it's an attempt to kind of, um, honor the fact that there are multiple layers of culture that are happening in Maryland and that uh, we have to kind of um, find a means and a method by which we can bring those together and honor all of them because of the fact that, um, because of the fact that what we're looking at is we have, because of the fact that culture isn't static Right, and so if culture isn't static, then the people who move through that culture take some and leave some, and we have to, in order to kind of reinforce the local food pathways, we have to take, um, we have to kind of move towards a an honoring of those things where they were found, I suppose, is the best way to put it. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm making sense. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's basically what we're attempting to do because of the fact that, I mean, we have layers upon layers, you know, and we have to figure out, we are going through the process of trying to figure out whose cultural meaningful seeds are going to be steward, stewarded by whom, right? Because of the fact that just because we are here doesn't mean that we have space to kind of 
not acknowledge that there are others who have culturally meaningful things that they're, they're bringing with them and that we've accept, you know that we've kind of drawn into ourselves right yeah you make perfect sense i'm gonna have to switch over and let um dolly have something to say real quick because we okay. and i don't mean to cut you off because you'll have another opportunity to speak but i want to make yeah, sure, sure everybody gets a chance so dolly you want to go ahead Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I come to this with a different perspective, I guess, because I'm not an Indigenous person, but, um, and, and uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my background. My background's in journalism, and um, my first ever job out of journalism school was working for an Indigenous publisher, um, and uh, we created this little monthly document. There's only about five stories in it every month, but um, he really wanted to focus on empowering narratives uh, on Indigenous peoples. We were based in Ottawa, sun ceded territory of Algonquin peoples, and there's a lot of different people from different nations in that area. And so he really wanted us to write stories that were really, really empowering. We looked at business owners, we looked at people working in social justice movements, we looked at chefs, we looked at photographers, like we really ran the gamut of um, the different stories that we were covering. And bringing that um, that empowering narrative to my work has been really, really important. And I've learned working in a couple of different newsrooms that sometimes it's hard to, <laughs> to bring that. You you know run into publishers, you run into people who maybe want a story to take a framework and, and you kind of have to say, no, this is how we're gonna talk about it. Um, and so I bring that up because the work that we're doing with the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project is very much um, based in those kind of empowering frameworks. Um, the work that we do looks to develop kind of the distinctive environmental justice framework that encapsulates um, Indigenous knowledge systems, laws, concepts of justice, lived experiences of Indigenous peoples. Um, and in the work that I'm doing, I'm, I help with um, a lot of the multimedia production that comes out of the, the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project. And so what we're doing is we're taking, um, as Deb mentioned, research that's already being done kind of in, in these justice areas and looking at specifically um, issues that affect Indigenous peoples. And we're really trying to make them accessible to people who are maybe in community, who are beyond the ivory tower. Um, you know, to other people who are land protectors, water stewards. Um, and in addition to kind of supporting those different communities that are facing their own forms of, of injustice, whatever they may be, we're also trying to educate people kind of beyond those communities, how to be respectful, how to engage with culture, how to engage with these different knowledge systems. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, this narrative is, is found kind of more and more as we go and as more people have their voices heard. Um, and yeah, I'll keep it short for now so we can move on to the next question. <laughs> okay, so um, So Anne Marie, I am looking for you on the thing. As we know, I'm not computer literate, so um, we would like you to quickly introduce yourself. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you. There you are. <laughs> good morning, everybody. I do apologize. I had some technical difficulties. Uh, always fun at the beginning of a Saturday morning, but that's that's fine. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm coming to you from same place Aura um, is coming from. I am Danette as well, Red Streak in the Water, Tobacco Beeple, Born for the Bitter Water People. So just as a short introduction, I really appreciate all my um, um, sisters here who are talking about their work and, and the, the incredible work that they're doing in their communities and for their peoples as well. I oversee the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, also known as ITEP. I've been doing that for about 10 years. And we have a program called the um, Tribal Climate um, Change Program. So this program has been in existence since 2009. And so we've been going throughout the country, training tribes and helping them develop their own adaptation plans. So the, as you know, the foundation for funding is a plan or some sort of strategic um, plan in the uh, in federal arena. And not too many tribes have funding for those um, 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 projects that they want to work on. So some of the things that um, my colleagues 
on this today's program talked about was you know peer reviewed information and so so some of the things that have been tackled i always try to find resolutions for so come the end of august there'll be um i tell, if you come to our website we'll be putting out the um, state of tribes and climate change report so it's a snapshot that of what's been happening in in tribal um, arena throughout the country it's been um, peer reviewed by many, many authors. So I really welcome you to come back and look for that. As far as TEK or traditional knowledges, um, I put a link in the um, chat box. Um, uh, a couple, probably in 2015, I saw, sat on an advisory committee where we put together what are guidelines for the use of traditional knowledges in climate change initiatives. So it's very specific for this arena. And it helps both the federal and non-federal uh, indigenous and non-indigenous partners work together, including free and prior informed consent. And we put a lot of the United Nations um, principles in that as well. And as far as the food issues that my other colleague Sanjo talked about was um, we, in the adaptation planning part, we really um, concentrate on what tribes are considering important in, in their arena. And food has become an underlying concern for many of our tribal um, brothers and sisters. So there's a great, um, if you look at our website, there's a great adaptation plan process and it includes a lot of food systems in there. So really encourage you, all of you just take a look at that. And again, apologies for running late, but I just wanna say thank you for the invitation. I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I guess one of the questions we want to make sure that gets tackled is um, with the now the um, current government having Native people in very key positions, um, I would like to know how you are able to or do you see um, can guide us into how you can utilize those to the benefit of all tribes and all you know people those that are registered and those that are not registered um, how do they access that and then what do you see for the future of this how does that um, give you hope for you know building out in terms of now we have some clout there and some access um, where are we going to go with that So since we have you right there, Anne-Marie, you want to jump in first? Well, thank you again. Uh, that's an excellent question. Actually, my son, he's 14 years old. He asked me that question. He's always asking me, he's really into politics. And so uh, he's always asking me, so what do you think about this, mom? What do you think about that, mom? And one of the questions he asked me, I think it was this morning, actually, he said, what do you think about Deb Hallen and the work that she's doing? And so um, as you know, the Secretary Deb Hallen is from um, New Mexico, from the Pueblo tribes there, and she sits as our current secretary. Um, the fact that the Biden administration selected her and into that key position where it oversees many of the federal lands, national parks, um, water issues that deal directly with tribal nations is incredible. And so um, uh, I think it's incredible, and I love that fact that she's in there. Uh, however, I did tell my son, and I'm just being straight and forward, forward here, is I'm concerned that um, there's, several, there's several federal Indian law books that talk about this, and that's the pendulum swimming, swinging back. So once the tribes have come to a place where we're recognized, you see us, you understand us, people are training on um, land acknowledgement and all those fundamental issues that should be trained in any school or university. Once that this administration ends, what is the, will the pendulum swing back to the other side where we're not recognized, where we're not seen, where we're not respected, where our treaties are not honored anymore, and where we're back into an invisible spot because we're of our um, population? You know, we don't have a huge population right now, so you know that is a power structure issue. So some of those issues. So I'm I'm optimistic. I'm very happy at this moment, but I'm also very cautious. And I'll just. I'll just stop there. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in? Deb, you look like a prime candidate. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so I can speak to the can like it's more like a comparative perspective, like, like just um, drawing a little bit upon what um, and Anne Marie said. In the Canadian context, there isn't anything 
um, there isn't anything like that. Even the establishment of the, the committee um, to advise on climate change, like there's, there's nothing like that in the Canadian context advising at that level. I mean, um, I, you know, there, there have been politicians who, who, um, who could hold ministerial portfolios, but sometimes they're in a very um, challenging um, position <laughs> and, uh, and, and leave. Like actually there was a Inuit um, woman uh, who, uh, who, who left um, the party because she, there, there's all these microaggressions that people experience, all these challenges that Henry talk, talked about that make it not a very welcoming um, place. But at the same time, from like my perspective, as I look to see um, what's happening uh, in, in the United States, I just go, wow, like they have someone in that position, huge, hugely influential. They've set up a committee to advise, they even actually talk about climate justice. Like Canada doesn't even like to go there. They just want to say climate change. So, so I see like, like there's real opportunities for leadership. And, uh, and and to see what can happen, but even having that there, like to me, is 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 inspiring, and and can and can really like kind of lead the way if it's possible for her um, and others to do that. But as Henry pointed out, I just call it like Indians are us. Like you're really popular for a period of time, and then you disappear, and then there's a backlash. So it's it's really hard to stay in the radar um, in a good, positive, constructive way. So. Um, so if they want to take that on, like I'm like, yay, like what can we do to support that? Um, and it would be it'd be amazing to see kind of what happens. But it's um, to me, I, I just sort of think I wish they kind of had that here, but eh, like not now. We're not there yet. So I don't know what that offers, but um, but I like to see that. Um, to me, it's inspiring, and it's um, and I'm following it, and and hopefully. Um, we'll see good things. She hasn't left, so that's good, right? So yeah. <laughs> she hasn't left before, so that's good, right? Thank you. Okay, so Aura? Yeah, thank you. So, well, you know, you. I worked in, in for the Navajo Nation as a tribal historic preservation officer for a little bit, and one of the things that I realized is that, you know, in, in recognition of these sort of pendulum swings back and forth, right? Where we are very much like in favor and we're not, or we're in centered and then we're not. And so one of the things I've learned is really trying to take that middle road and, and create these collaborative opportunities with the agencies that we, we partnered with or that you know we, we really have to work with. And so for me, one of the things I think, you know, since there is that momentum I think it's really important for our indigenous leaders who are put into these leadership positions to be able to really advocate for grassroots approaches or these like localized approaches that we've seen come up. And so um, one of the examples that I like to point to is the Bears Ears co-management project. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with the Navajo Nation, uh, the president's office, as well as with other tribal nations um, as the TIPO to really create a management plan for the archeological and cultural resources. But we also had to involve the environmental resources our you know, natural resources. And so it was really an amazing thing to see all of us in one room together, really centered on protecting our, our shared culture, our understanding our connections of these places of bears ears. And so I would really like to, to see that pushed. And, and so with the other thing, I just want to acknowledge the, um, the nomination of one of my Northwestern relatives and, and Charles Sams III, a Uma, uh, tribal member of the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla, who is being nominated as the director of the National Park Service. And this is something that is unprecedented. Um, although there are tribal there are several national park units on tribal lands. There has never been a tribal person, tribal member involved or in, in these leadership, leadership positions. And so I really want to see some of those things happening. But you know, the other thing that I, I really want, I would really like see the opportunity for is the inclusion of indigenous knowledge in these spaces. And so really looking at how we can implement like uh, citizen scientist programs where we have our community members collecting data and they have a very sort of unique and nuanced view of their own homeland. So why not implement some of these things so that they're able to, to be a part of what's being said and, and to be a part of the solution 
rather than having people come in and tell them what's wrong and hear our solutions. We know that never works. So, you know, I'd like to see some of those changes. See the opportunity. Okay. So, uh, Chandra, do you have something you want to input or Dolly? Well, actually, <laughs> for me, it's I come again. I come to this from a different perspective. We are a um, we are a state recognized tribe. Therefore, we do not partake of the federal monies that are available for Native Americans. Um, <laughs> so, therefore, for me, it's great to see things happen as a thought exercise but it doesn't really trickle down to us in the state of Maryland. I mean, it, it trickles down in the sense that there's a positive bent to writing grants for national, you know, access to national park service land and things of that nature. But to actually say, well, this is what's happening. It doesn't, it, it affects us, but it's, you're talking about something that's happening on a federal level and we don't have that recognition. So we don't have that access. That's a good point because there are many, many uh, tribal people that are part of so-called non-recognized tribes that are mixed bloods that are have been working for environmental causes and living in a life that um, is part of the natural world. That that's where they live. That's their. Um, you know, their whole screen, somebody asked the question, how do we do this without involving science which doesn't always work or prove to be true? Um, and that's a very good question for each one of you. How in your own lives do you use um, or can you help other people understand being part of the natural world? This is part of indigenous culture and regardless of if you're recognized or not because we know who we are. The point is, uh, how do we get this knowledge translated from the very grassroots in the classrooms of young children firing their imagination and, and uplifting their um, cultural and tribal uh, knowledge to translate out so that it can be a worldview? I know that's a big question, but anybody want to jump in on this one? Um, I can actually jump in if that's okay. Um, some of the work that we're doing with the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project is um, actually going into classrooms and doing workshops where we do story work with children. Um, and uh, we have one Anishinaabe cre recreation story that we kind of go through with them. Um, usually this is led by Deb and then kind of supported by the other members of the, uh, of the IEJ project. Um, and so we'll do things like read the recreation story, kind of sit on it and talk about it a little bit, talk about what the different lessons are, talk about what the story would mean to the culture. Um, you know, we talk about how um, uh, knowledge sharing can happen through storytelling. So for example, along with the stories that we're telling, we'll post pictures of you know, some of the different animals that are featured because some of these children have never, you know, seen what a beaver looks like or what a mink looks like or, you know, whatever, whatever else is in the story. Um, and so through this, we also do some word association exercises and we just kind of teach youth that, um, uh, you know, this is a different way of looking at the world. Look at these natural laws that kind of come through this Indigenous learning. Look at that how knowledge is transferred. Look at how you hold on to the knowledge when you learn it in this way versus learning it out of a textbook. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're, we're really working on is kind of finding different ways again to, to have these learnings, not just have them kind of on a piece of paper that somebody writes down, you know, and it's never seen again. Uh, Deb really preaches the idea of living knowledge and passing on knowledge and, and keeping it going forward. Um, we also, um, have some youth who have worked with us before and we featured some of the projects that they've done. Uh, during the pandemic, we had three youth who uh, worked with us on their own individual projects about how they stayed in touch with the land and the community, uh, even kind of at this time when everybody was staying at home. Um, and we just featured them on our website. So it's also about giving people platforms to share the information that they have. Awesome, thank you. So one of the questions is now that we have um, Deb Holland and that position, how do we, um, how do how does one have access to her? How do you get 
to be part of that voice and that conversation is one of the questions, how you would approach that and, and is there something in the works, how we can all collaborate with each other. The other thing is how much of going back to the land is happening in your perspective communities because if you don't understand the land and you never put your bare feet on her, if you never put your hands in the earth, um, it to me seriously takes away from and actually diminishes your understanding of the whole environmental thing because there is a connection that is made in that way and Native people have known that forever. So um, part of that is is that happening in your communities? Are you working towards those things? And even for professionals, um, when I have different workshops or things that I'm doing, I'll ask people right away, take your shoes off, put your feet on, bare feet on the earth. And some people have told me they haven't put their bare feet on the earth for 20, 30 years. <laughs> How could that be? Or gardeners who only wear gloves instead of putting your hands in the earth and having that connection. Those valuable pieces are missing in, uh, and then people wanna know why they're burnt out and all of that. It's because that part is not all, it also is not translated, I think. Um, and it's so very important. So how, how do these things become inclusive in what you're passing down? Um, and also one other thing that I think to, so that we make sure that, as you said before, that we leave people with an uplifted um, way of viewing things, how we can energize and connect people to what you do. How can they reach out to you if they want to interact with you or learn more from you? Are you open to that? Because um, a lot of times we leave these things and say, damn, I wish I could have talked to so-and-so more or I could get involved with their project. And even on the grassroots, maybe my organization would like to work with somebody. So I'll throw that back out there. And, um, you know, let's talk about how one gets to Deb Holland to um, help and to work with her to bring your things to her and say, let's co collaborate with these things. It's wonderful she's in that position, but if you can't reach her, then, you know, it's the same to me, same thing that's been happening all along. And I know she's overwhelmed, but there maybe there's a process through um, collaboration that can happen. So I see Aura, you're nodding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dolly. Yes, definitely. You know, I think those are really good questions and, and really a lot to think about. So just sort of going back to, you know, how do we actually do this? And although I'd love to say that there is, you know, there's an easy way to do that, there's not. You, there's no template, there's no one size fits all for this kind of work. And I think one of the ways that this work starts is by working with the community, starting with the community. What does the community want? What do they need? And, and they know what and how to approach this. And so, you know, as someone in a sort of academic position, there are different approaches that, you know, we would sort of talk about, but coming from community as a member of a community, it's really, like I said, it begins with the community. There are already conversations that are happening within communities about these issues. And, you know, in, in the work that I did for Navajo Nation and in, in doing the archaeological work, we'd have to ask about, you know, the sacred places, the plant and medicine gathering areas, offering places and in a way to protect them. And what we heard, what I heard from a lot of our people is that there are a lot of our sort of traditional or the, the usual and accustomed sort of cycles that, that were in place for hundreds of years are changing. And they recognize these things. And so one of the things that's always sort of struck me was we were working with an elderly woman and she mentioned that there were 12 different kinds of rain that were recognized by Navajo people. And that in her lifetime and to where she was about five years ago, 
she had only seen four types of rain within that about a 20 to 30 year time period. And so she was really concerned about that and, and how our world was changing. And so that's what I mean. Our people have that knowledge. They have those ideas already. And it's up to our us as, as community members to help and support in any way that we can. You know, I wish I could give a, a you know more concrete sort of approach, but whatever community that you're a part of, you work to support that community and to uplift their needs and their concerns. And that's how I approach my community's needs in this way is listening to them and understanding what my position is and the ways that I can contribute to this program or to this issue, this effort. And so I don't have the answers, but I have skills that I can contribute to help these programs and to help these efforts. And so for me, that's really, you know, the, the approach that I use and, and it looks different for every community. So you sort of have to navigate that. And, and that's part of the work too, is getting to know the community and putting work in with them. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. And as far as contacting <laughs> federal entities, you know, I, I rely on my tribal government to do that work for me, but I also contact my elected officials on my own and, you know, make sure that you use your own collectives to, to help push and, and move those efforts or those issues forward. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, Anne Marie, how about you? You have something you would like to contribute to that? Sure, thank you. And thank you for the great um, answers. I think one of the things that we I work on with um, Deb Hallen's team is a 3030 project. Anyone heard of that one? It's um it's a conservation method to protect 30% of the waters and 30% of the lands throughout the United States by 2030. So it's 303030. 30. And so um, what she's asked is that tribal leaders really take a look at it. Because as you know, conservation, as great as it is, often happens on tribal community lands because those are the ones that are pretty much still pristine. And so when you go into conservation methods, you really have to consider that tribes are still using the land. So if you say we can't do anything on your land because we're conserving it for the rest of the nation, that's not really fair for a tribe. So I really wanna um, caution people on, and this is, happens all across the world, you know, 80% of the biodiversity is still within indigenous lands. You know, that's a UN statistic. And so when you're, when folks now are asking, hey, let's preserve all this land, they're asking at, at for it at the detriment of the indigenous peoples who are still there. So, um, so this conservation method, the 30 by 30 um, project is to take a look at this mechanism, but also consider tribal leaders, leading tribal leaders sit on this committee and they are um, very aware of these issues around conservation with respect to indigenous peoples. I just wanna go back to one question you had about students and how you inspire them. Um, ITEP has a great environmental outreach program where we um, train the Native American students at Northern Arizona University to go in to classrooms and teach the Native American students classrooms. So it's, it could be on anything, could be air quality, water quality, um, solar, different types of projects. But what happens in that, that re, small meeting between the two is that the, the youth see a Native American college student and they're they're inspired by just that and then the college student then is able to help that student rise up and we've had great turnouts um, in 2019 before the pandemic we were reaching 22,000 native students a year and one of our alumni out of that program is the now current Navajo Nation president Jonathan Ness so it's it's a lot of great things that are happening I'll put that website in there again but it's if, if you can have a native youth or any youth train another youth. That's one way they have to learn it and then they have to teach it. There's one way to teach and then inspire one another because a lot of times youth don't wanna to listen to an older person. They wanna see someone their age that makes it fun and their flair. So that's one um, mechanism we're using at ITO. That's awesome. And yes, thank you for putting that in, out there and in the chat. I think the fact that 
you know, this is um, happening in one area, it would be awesome to be able to have that spread out amongst all of the people and, and you know, not just that specific university or tribal um, group, but it's needed everywhere. It's needed, as you know. And so that would be the other thing. How do, so if people could maybe um, interact with that organization or that process and build it out to their own people. And again, I, I know I keep saying uh, federal uh, groups that are not federally recognized, but there are so many native people that are mixed blood or that are not recognized or tribes are not recognized that are doing tremendous work that feel isolated because they can't get to um, the powers that be so to speak and but so many awesome grassroots things that are happening and it would what is the outreach that can be done to pull them in and and help them be accepted and feel like their voice is just as important and, and can be and will be heard. <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I know that what we're doing, generally speaking, um, the organization that I'm the director of, we're not actually um, affiliated with the Piscataway tribe. Um, I, you know, I was going to say either of the two or three of them, there's three. Um, and but what we're doing is kind of like, it's related to it. It's on their land, it's around their land, it's in their water, you know? So we, you know, we do have an oyster program that we're standing up, we, you know, in the Patuxent. We do have um, food forests that we're placing on school property um, through a couple of the counties for the purposes of, you know, um, food sovereignty and, um, a, and basically, a, creating a space for kids to start to reorient themselves with um with the land I mean but I don't know necessarily that that there I don't know how that would work as far as bringing in um tribes you know for us simply because of the fact that there is so much tension um uh, with the tribes uh that that I believe that it would kind of detract, to be perfectly honest. You know, there, there's some, there's this, there's an authoritarianism that kind of happens, you know, and it's a lot of top down things that happen. And um, my preference would be that, you know, we, as a cooperative answer to the people as opposed to um, a person. Okay to the conversation is um yeah just building upon the the comments by um by others is i guess if you want to call it an advantage it doesn't feel like that sometimes how much rather to be, be in communities is in the academic world you can sort of transcend a bit of that and reach out to whoever's interested you like you don't need to concern yourself about who's recognized or not recognized when you go with broader sort of ideas about Indigenous, so for example, UNDRIP. UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People isn't so concerned about who's recognized in the constitution or not. So it can be, so it can be a lot broader um, and um, facilitating gatherings where people can share these kind of, um, share these kind of voices and not be, um, and, and just, I, I think the other thing is just to recognize a, a lot of different people and groups and organizations are doing really amazing work and you don't need to replicate everything people are doing. You just need to sort of connect with them um, and then trying to support and identify those who may not be getting that kind of support so that they can, um, so they can somehow um, network with each other. I think is an approach that I've tried to take. So I don't identify people, they sort of, you know, come whether they're artists or activists or um, <laughs> even gender like, um, you know, more gender fluid, non-binary kind of identity, like where, where, like sometimes people wonder where they fit in in these kind of processes. So I think um, that might be one of the, I, I would say, I never feel like it's an advantage, but you know, cause you're so, spend so much time what I call feeding the beast all the time, but that is one of them. Like if, if I'm working within indigenous organizations and I do, then it's true, I am more limited because it'll only be like First Nations or it's only gonna be Inuit. It's very, 
um, distinctions based in um, in that kind of way. But in the in the academic or university context, you can kind of transcend that um, transcend that a little bit because you can decide who your accountability is to as. Aura pointed out, it can be to the communities. My accountability is to the communities because literally I still live there and I could be called out. And so I better be serving them, right, in, in, in good ways. Um, and just to just to touch on the other question that you asked, first of all, I have no idea how to get a hold of Dom Holland. So I'm like the worst person ever <laughs> about that. So is um, uh, so some of the work we're doing in terms of reaching out to, to, to youth is, again, it, it goes back to like a, acknowledging our own knowledge and experiences. So one of the projects that we're doing right now is um, developing, it'll probably be what they call the graphic novel or, or comic identified by, actu actually developed by youth. So they're writing the whole thing, designing it. And it's based on, um, again, the 13 moons, because you need a framework. Like we had our own theories and frameworks for thinking about all of this, right? We just you just got cut up in other spheres, but when you go back to that. So it's based on what they've been experiencing and seeing under each full moon from their own perspective. So that's what it's based on. That's the content for it. It's not like me saying it should be this, it should be that, because I went to this meeting in Ottawa and it should be this, or I read this article. It's not, it's totally based mm -hmm. on what did they notice? What did they see? Like, and, and writing kind of the, the narrative um, and doing the art around that. Something I actually can't do, because I'm pretty useless at that kind of thing. So it's sort of like letting go of some things and just letting that knowledge come from um, the youth and people themselves because they're really, that, that, to me, the most important things I've ever learned is usually not from reading stuff. It's usually from listening and being in communities and learning from elders youth ago. I never thought about that. That is just so interesting. Um, so, so trying to facilitate the, those kind of processes as, as much as possible. So as a uh, um, Anna Marie, because I'm like pretty old and they definitely don't want to listen to yet another middle-aged lady tell them what they should be doing in their lives, right? So it is, so they're more likely to listen to each other and, and get inspired, um, uh, inspired from each other. You can be there to support if you know that to support and guide rather than start directing people, because um, that kind of, I find having raised two teenage sons kind of turns them off. So, <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. So hopefully some of that was useful. So just kind of leading off of Deb's comments and, and, and Marie also, you know, there's part of the work that I was involved in for Navajo Nation. Well, the, the reason why I am an archeologist now is because I worked in the Navajo Nation Archeology span Department student training program. And so basically that program gave me the opportunity to actually do archeological field work, but at the service of our people. And so we went out and we did home site surveys, water line survey, power line survey, road surveys. And so all of the infrastructural needs on the nation, they have to go through these environmental archeological clearances. And so as youth, we were able to go out and do that work, but a very important part of that work was working with the community and, and speaking to them about these places and capturing that in a way where we were able to give that back to the community, but also protect that for the tribe and then also protecting these areas. And that was such a valuable experience for me. And looking at Anne-Marie's example of ITEP's um, environmental training program, the ability for us to teach and train our youth in, in our own ancestral knowledge combined with these other sort of Western tools, I think is, is really, an opportunity to give our, our, our youth, our children, the skills and the opportunities that they'll need in, in order to carry this work further. We know that each generation does their part and, and pushes as hard as they can to, you know, address these issues and, and to help our communities. And so, you know, it really is upon us as, as we enter into these later stages of our life to, to give back and, and share that knowledge that we've gained. And for me, it really is in those training programs. And something that really just really hit me was what Deb said about recognizing their own knowledge and, and the power that that knowledge has. And that is so powerful in, in providing training to our youth because we've sort of gone through these histories where our knowledge, like I said, is relegated to you know myth and, and superstition, but we know what's true and, and giving that to our children, that knowledge, that ability to recognize how special that is, 
to me is the way that we keep pushing forward. And so, you know, in, in making sure that we create this next generation of environmental justice warriors, we also have to do our part to support them and to help them develop the skills that they need. So just leave it at that. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions in the chat and I don't know if we're gonna have time to get to them. However, if you all would take a look at them and respond, um, I'm thinking that we can probably go on the chat and respond to these questions. How can the use of the knowledge of culture, natural world and live experiences um, by direction of indigenous leaders to frame environmental justice in all communities versus using science tools, which don't always work. I think we touched on that. And, and the other question is what efforts are underway to work with the Department of Interior's leadership on um, issues of concerns raised today? This person manages Kina, um, the US Fish and Wildlife Services, EJ, um, program. So we might have to answer those in the chat and, you know, again, give links so that the con conversation can continue. Um, timekeeper, I'm not sure where we are at the moment, but I think we're probably heading to the very end. So if there's, if we can do those in the chat, we have seven minutes. So, <laughs> um, how do we link with the Department of Interior? I guess we've at, raised that question before. This person um, is with Fish and Wildlife Services in Environmental Justice Program, but I'm sure many other people are wanting to know the same thing um, on these issues we've raised. So Anne-Marie, take it away. Okay. Real quick. <laughs> so um, I, I, I don't have the link, but I'll look for it after I speak. There is um, the Biden administration put forward an environmental justice or um, um, committee, uh, advisory committee. And on that committee sits four indigenous peoples. Um, Dr. Kyle Powell White out of University of Michigan, um, one of the tribal leaders from the Havasupai tribe here in Arizona, Jade Begay from Indigenous Environmental Network and an elder out of um, Alaska. Um, those people would be your first hand into those environmental justice issues. And they would be the ones who would be, um, should be, uh, taking calls from constituents and calls from our, our brothers and sisters out in the field. So I, I mean, I can look up that website and put it up there for you so you can reach forward. As far as reaching Deb Thank Hallen, um, yeah, as far as reaching Deb Hallen, I mean, calling her office. I mean, it's as simple as calling her office and saying, I'm interested in these initiatives. You may not get directly to her, but you will get put into a, a committee or some kind of information or given some kind of information that would lead you to um, help you with whatever project you're doing. That's what her team is for. Um, whether it's water rights, they have a great water rights program now. They are led by indigenous peoples now. She's been very careful in curating an, uh, an indigenous um, talent there at, at at the Department of Interior, I've noticed. So um, I don't think if you call in and say, you know, I want help with um, fish and wildlife services or fish issues or um, uh, treaty rights and those types of issues, I think you would go straight to a person that could help you. So um, I just wanna encourage you to call in or write in. Um, that's how, you know, I got in. <laughs> It takes some time, you know, with any federal government, but after a while you, you begin to know people, but I'll put the link in for that environmental justice um, advisory committee. All right, awesome. And is there anybody else that wants to, has something burning they didn't say yet that they would like to say? One of the only things that I would add, I'll be really quick, or if you have a chance to, I can see you, you're reaching for the button, um, is, so, so right now, like all the rage right now, like in the United Nations is this nature-based solutions thing. And, um, and when I think about that, I go, well, that's kind of what indigenous peoples are already doing. So supporting indigenous peoples, um, lives on the land, uh, the community level, grassroots level, like that's actually key to addressing some of the big global challenges that we're facing. So. 
um, so to, I, I see that as an opportunity, but there's also, but Indigenous people sort of have to make sure whatever it is they're doing doesn't get appropriated, gets called something that isn't actually how they talk about it. But to me, I look at that, and I'm like, hey, there's an opportunity, something that Indigenous peoples already know a lot about. Um, so I just wanted to sort of end with that, because I think there's these little openings and opportunities where Indigenous peoples can share their knowledge and take leadership and, and show that. So we need to support each other to, to create those kind of spaces. So I'll, uh, I'll stop there. If I could just one thing to tag on about the UN issues is one of the things I hark on is that in the, in the United Nations system, um, indigenous peoples are not recognized as members, we're recognized as observers. So one of the issues I always have is that we go to these um, meetings, high level COPs, um, COP21, COP26 is coming up. But anyway, um, and, and indigenous peoples are not brought in as members to advise, but they're just to observe. And every once in a while, we get a little space to speak. And I always, I always question that whole theory because it's indigenous peoples right now that are leading the way around climate change initiatives. We're putting forward um, what we already know inst inst instinctively to protect our cultures and to protect our lands. And now people are asking us for that information. However, they're not making us members at these high level. They're just asking for the information taking it again without um, respect to who we are as sovereign nations or as, as indigenous peoples within these lands. So that's one thing I have to, a little thing I always hark on when it comes to United Nations issues. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> if I could just add something as well, again, kind of from an ally settler perspective, um, one of the things that I run into in my work, both in the academia and kind of land use planning, which is my other job, is um, sometimes people just don't know how to start a relationship or start working with Indigenous communities. Um, and to that, I would say, um, if you can find a way to proactively build relationships before, you know, maybe a big issue comes up or, um, you know, some sort of conflict comes up, I've been told, you know, it's as easy as doing lunch once a month with maybe the community leaders and, you know, municipal leaders or federal leaders or, or whoever they are. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of intimidation around working with Indigenous peoples because, um, I don't, I don't even know, I guess just like past histories have, have been so conflict driven. And so if there's ways that you and your organizations can kind of build these proactive relationships that aren't just taking, that are giving back to these communities, um, if there's a way that you can do that, help communities build capacity, that's another thing that I hear all the time is, you know, offices, band offices in Canada want to be involved in different things, but they might not have the time, they might not have the staff, they might not have the finances. So if there's ways that you can support you know, what's already happening in community. I think it was Aura who said it earlier that, you know, people know what they want. People know what needs to happen. They just need the support to make it happen. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Another thing is, it's not that hard. It's just respect. And that's what has been missing all along is the respect of native people and their voices, you know, not, from not honoring treaties to how many missing and um, murdered women in, you know, all of those issues that are everyday things that Native people have to skirt around and so, um, and really bring forward. I think that all of us, if, and can you just, in each of you, maybe in one or two words, as Indigenous women or not, for someone to approach you, what would you advise them in terms of how, since this seems to be an issue, which is to me, you know, um, how do you have someone approach you? What is the way that someone can and not be intimidated, but be respectful in, re in approaching you to get a positive response? You know, one of the things that I can recommend, um, is showing up, being there, being present in community. And, you know, if you're really interested in supporting a community and helping them, then show up, go and, and help 
in any way that you can, whether that's, you know, one of my favorite examples about showing up is the Hope, the former Hopi Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, you know, he would do all of these talks for his colleagues and, you know, be help with um, reports and books and articles and things like that. And so once a year, what he would do as a sort of reciprocal process, he would call all of them up to his home on the mesas and each one of those people would help him harvest his corn. And so he would work them for the weekend and they would put work in and they would help him harvest his corn. Mm -hmm. The best part about that is his corn went to feed the entire community, his whole village. And so that was his way of leveraging all those favors and those talks that those people came to him with. And, and it really made them recognize how, how important it is to show up. And that if you are really willing to have a relationship, if you're really willing to help these communities, then you show up in any way that you can. And sometimes, you know, as an academic, that might seem a little strange to you, but like you said, it's always good to get your hands into the earth. Sometimes it's good to roll your sleeves up and do the work. None of us is above work. Well, none of us is above helping and recognizing that, that no matter what your title is, you help the community that you really want to be a part of or that you want to contribute to. So that's what I would leave you with. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Anybody else have any parting words before we leave? I think we're ticking down here. <laughs> I think one thing I always tell my the staff that I work with or the community members I work with is when you come in, come in with humility, come in knowing that um, you're coming into a society that's not yours. And if you have a problem, come in with a, a, a proposed solution. It, there's nothing more annoying than bringing all your problems in and then, and then just say, fix it all for me. You know, come in with, oh, this is what I think would work well, you know. And then we start from there. Then you start the negotiations on whether or not that's going to be suitable for you and the society. So that's one of my recommendations. Thank Great. you again Thank for you. today's talk. Thank you. Chandra? Oh, sorry, I'll just be really quick. I was just okay. going to agree with what's been said and, and the idea again of showing up, like go, like don't wait. And you're going to be uncomfortable and you and that's the only way you're going to learn about that there's actually different perspectives all indigenous people aren't one big blob who all think the same so it's important to to go and to go to different and and start making the connections um in in friendship as opposed to showing up when you want something people in communities get enough of that so other than what's already said that's all i would add to it and equity that's a huge word there's got to be equity, which we never covered, but um, in all forms of equity, economic as well as um, cultural, um, you know, equity in, in what you're bringing or asking. Um, too many times the funds aren't allocated that go down to the grassroots people that really need them to be able to continue the work, these small grassroots organizations, or even to start some that can be youth supported. So um, how to access those dollars is another very important um, conversation that needs to happen. And when these grants are written, not as an afterthought, I'll hire one of you to speak. No, how do we get you at the table at the onset and that you're getting those same resources and those millions of dollars sometimes to, um, allocate where you know living in a community they need to go you all are awesome i am so excited to um be able to sit on a panel with you and i hope i didn't talk too much and drown <laughs> your time but i thank spirit for this wonderful um time that we had together and may it go forward in a very um inspiring, uplifting and, and way that we can continue to hear each other's voices and speak to each other and really build this relationship and bring in other women and young girls and children into this conversation. Miigwech. <laughs> yes. 
Enjoy the next session, everyone, and wonderful to meet everyone. You too. Stay you in too. touch, everyone. We have each other's information in the <laughs> chat. Please take advantage <laughs> of that. All right. Yes, thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Chandra, I'm at the Patuxent Riverkeeper headquarters. We got to hook up. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. We have oysters. <laughs> okay. I'm leaving. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for an awesome panel. Okay, thank you.